And welcome to episode 15 of the David Bernard Podcast. I'm along with Fox 8 meteorologist Zach Fredella today. We've got an interesting topic today, Zach. What if I told you there is a method that could reasonably and accurately predict weather patterns up to 300 days away? And not just patterns, specific storms and maybe even hurricanes. Well, there's a man out there that believes it, he's researched it, and he uses it. Today, we're going to speak with Gary Lezak. Gary has been a good friend of mine for many years. He's the chief meteorologist for the embassy affiliate in Kansas City. And Gary's been studying this uh, for decades, a hypothesis. This was uh, first observed by another meteorologist 70, almost 80 years ago. It's known as the cycling pattern hypothesis. In short, uh, the belief is there are patterns in the atmosphere that repeat in such a way that forecasts for mainly, I would say, big weather events can be foreseen up to almost a year in advance, 300 days. And that number 300 is significant, and we're going to talk to Gary about that. Uh, Gary, through his own observation and research, has coined it the Lezak recurring cycle, and he's been studying this and using it uh, since the 1980s. The LRC, we've been talking about this, you and I have been talking about this for over a year now, and it, it, this is some interesting stuff. I'm really excited about today's podcast because I want to know more. I mean, as meteorologists studying any type of scientific things that can help us better understand what's going on and maybe forecast in advance, that's all great. And we've known, I mean, we learned about this in school. You have teleconnections, you have the the El Nino, La Nina. We know about all of these long-term type impacts that that can have on the weather, but we don't have something that specifically can point to, hey, maybe this might be a reoccurring time that you could see a storm or in this case, a hurricane. That's what we're more kind of in tune to, uh, like a specific point of the year or a specific point of hurricane season where we need to watch for maybe a hurricane strike. That's what this kind of goes along those lines. And so that's why I'm excited to learn a little bit more and um, and see exactly how this all comes to be and how you know he figured this out uh, in the long run. Well, there are a number of examples that he can point to over the years, and especially we're going to hone in on tropical activity. Obviously, that's of great interest to us here uh, along the Gulf Coast. We also have on today's podcast, Eric Buris, and Eric is a broadcast meteorologist in Orlando, and he has studied Gary's atmospheric recurring cycle theory, and he even uses it uh, at his own local station. So we're going to get uh, his feedback on how that's gone over at the station and with his fellow meteorologists and viewers in Central Florida. And right now we actually have Fred out there. We've been tracking Fred for the past several days and Fred is part of this whole cycle. And that's one thing, one reason why I, I was looking at Eric's uh, social media accounts and whatnot. And he's been saying, hey, mid-August, we have to watch out in Florida. And sure enough, Fred's forecast right now takes it towards Florida. So that's part of that whole LRC, the cycle. And I guess we should point out today is August 12, 2021, when this is being recorded. And as Zach pointed out, uh, we have Fred, which is of this hour, a depression uh, just off the coast of Cuba. I guess uh, the thoughts are, what do you think is going to happen with Fred? It looks like it's going to stay off the Cuban coastline. That's the first good thing you can say going for Fred. Yeah, and it's it's a it's going right through the mountains of Hispaniola, and it looks bad. I mean, there's barely it's just a swirl of clouds right now. There's really no uh, thunderstorm activity, uh, but now it's back over water, and it looks like it's going to ride the coast of Cuba till the Florida Straits, and so we should see it probably organize back into a tropical storm. But right now, uh, you know, all indications are this is going to be an eastern Gulf type of storm uh, that we're going to be watching into the weekend. And this may come into play as well. Uh, behind that, we have Invest Area 95 over the Central Atlantic. That's another one. You know, the, and this is the time of year. We've been talking about this the past several weeks that, look, the, the switch is going to flip. We're getting to that peak hurricane season, August 20th. That's when Dr. Gray uh, used to ring that bell, and that's where we're getting towards. So we're going to have another one. The next name on the list would be Grace if Invest 90L, which is in the Central Atlantic, uh, actually ever develops uh, down the line. Well, remember, you can always watch this podcast on fox8live.com slash David. We have a video version. And if you're watching the video version and you want to listen to the rest of it in your car or on one of your favorite podcast apps, we're on all the various podcast apps, Spotify, Apple, and uh, several others in addition to that. So on that note, uh, let's bring in today's guests, Gary Lezak and Eric Buris. Gary and Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. 
I think this is going to be an exciting discussion. I made a very brief description of the cycling pattern hypothesis uh, during our introduction here a few moments ago, uh, but we want to hear it from you, Gary. Uh, to begin with, who is Jerome? Now I'm going to mess it up. Nemias. Nemias. Jerome Nemias. Let's start with him. He is. Uh, he was head of the Weather Bureau the long range forecasting division of the Weather Bureau in the 1940s and 1950s. And he developed this thing. He, he published a couple hundred papers in a couple books. Um, and one of them was called the Index Cycle. And I stumbled across his work when uh, I was writing my peer reviewed paper on the cycling pattern hypothesis, which is known as the LRC. But Dr. Fred Carr said, have you ever heard of uh, Jerome Nemias? And I said, uh, no. And he said, you should read this paper called The Index Cycle. It sounds similar to your hypothesis. So I read through it and he was close to what my theory is. And uh, he had discovered that by November, there's enough information in the weather patterns to know what's gonna happen the following winter. And for some reason, uh, for weeks at a time, uh, a cycle can exist, but what he didn't realize is that that entire cycle repeats over and over and over again, all the way till October when the new pattern sets up. So, uh, but he is the first one that I know of that actually had something similar to what we're sharing with you today here. So when we talk about the cycling pattern hypothesis, um, dig in just a little bit more about uh, what we're talking about, because we're going to we're going to talk so uh, meteorologists out there will understand, but also uh, for folks that aren't meteorologists that are listening, um, we're, we're talking about using patterns globally to predict this, correct? Right. Uh, the, the basic there's basics to the what the cycling pattern hypothesis is, which uh, our bloggers back in 2002, 2003 actually named it after me the Lee Zach recurring cycle or the LRC. I just call it my hypothesis. They thought it should have a name, so it stuck as the LRC. And what I had developed in the 1980s, behind me on my wall, you might see this mural of pictures. And that's when I first sort of discovered it or affirmed up what this was all about in 1987 and 1988. There was a major one foot snowstorm in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City and they only average eight inches of snow a year. And about five, six weeks later, seven weeks later, there was another one foot snowstorm in Oklahoma City, not to mention ice storms and major winter, almost like what they just had this past winter. And I noticed that the pattern that produced the major snowstorm, the second one, looked awfully similar to the first one. And I was beginning to realize then that there was a relationship. Years later, fast forward to 2002, 2003, 15 years later, um, I I've developed the hypothesis where a pattern sets up every early fall, late September, early October, around October 5th, 6th or 7th is when it really begins. And it becomes established. And these things called anchor ridges and troughs set up and they tell you where the storm systems are gonna reach peak strength and weakest strength, where the anchor ridges are weakest and where the anchor troughs are, where the storms are strongest. And then the pattern sets up, there's a cycle that develops. This year's cycle just happens to be about 46 to 47 days. Every year is different. So this fall, a brand new pattern will set up that's never happened before. And then, then the entire pattern repeats. So it's not just the tropics that follow this, everything within the northern hemisphere does so uh, from china japan where the tokyo olympics were across europe all the way to the united states north america mexico um, the entire pattern is under the influence of this cycle cycling pattern and you can make predictions based off of it that's basically what it is all about what is the significance of october um I'm not exactly 100% certain. I've got an idea. The, the sun sets at the North Pole on the autumnal equinox. So this every year, autumnal equinox, the sun sets at the North Pole. But here, you know, in 
Louisiana and Florida and Kansas City, the, we have about an hour of twilight, and then it gets dark. At the North Pole, it's about 10 days to two weeks of twilight, and then it gets dark. It finally is dark at the North Pole. Right about the time that it goes to total darkness is right around the time, October 5th, 6th, or 7th, two weeks after the, the solstice, uh, the vernal equinox. And, um, and that's about the time. So there's got to be some astronomical cause or reason if that hypothesis is correct. But something like that happens in the fall that starts the pattern and then it exists until the next fall. All right, Zach, you've been following uh, Eric's uh, Twitter feed and uh, kind of getting some insight into uh, how he's using this. Yeah, I mean, for those that don't know, this is Eric, and he's a, he's a broadcast meteorologist in Orlando, and I've been following you, Eric, for a while now. I, get, I, I tune into your coffee talks and whatnot every morning, and um, I know earlier in the spring you posted, okay, these are the reoccurring parts of the LRC and when we need to watch uh, during hurricane season. You know, how did you come about the Gary's hypothesis, and, you know, how has how's this played out? So uh, I, I work for a television station in Orlando, but I also work with weather departments all across the country. And uh, so I met a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeremy Nelson, who worked with Gary several years ago. And so Gary taught Jeremy the LRC. And Jeremy and I have become friends over the years. And, and it started off with Jeremy just saying, I like these days there's going to be something tropical around you. And I said, but that's six months from now. How could you possibly have a clue? And he said, just do it and I'll tell you later. So he took it on the approach of, I'm going to blow your mind and then we'll backfill it with information. And after a couple of years of him doing this, I finally said, okay, Mr. Magic, teach this to me. You're not David Copperfield. And so he started kind of teaching me the basics and you know, I worked through it for several years and it, it got to the point where I got to the point where I wanted to do this uh, on, on my morning broadcasts on my Twitter feed and, and Jeremy put me in touch with Gary and, and now, you know, I'm so honored to say that Gary and I will shoot messages back and forth. David, like you uh, today, I've had Gary on my uh, morning broadcast talking about the LRC. We've even talked about this year's hurricane forecast. Um, and you know, the more I've used it, the more, the more I feel like my head explodes because as Gary, as you've said, there is chaos in the atmosphere, but there is organization to that chaos. Okay, well, let's let's get right into this. And, and, and you know, for us along the Gulf Coast and certainly uh, for Eric in Central Florida, it is hurricane season. And the part about the LRC that interests me the most is exactly that, and for obvious reasons. Uh, we're not dealing with uh, snowstorms on the Gulf Coast traditionally. Uh, widespread tornado outbreaks really aren't our thing. It's hurricane season. And, and Gary, let's start talking, and Eric, about 2020, what happened last year, what's already happened this year and what may be happening or is happening in the next week. And, and, and explain, and so what I'm going to talk about is I want to talk about hurricane Ada from 2020 Elsa this year and what Elsa may have to do with Fred that's currently over Cuba. How does the LRC explain these three storms? Well, the weather pattern sets up in October and November. So Ada happened around November the 10th or so. Um, and so when Ada developed, you apply the LRC to it, and then you, it's about a 46 to 47 day cycle this year, and it will come out to right about mid-August for a system. But not just mid-August, 46 days earlier was late June and early July. So exactly 46 days ago right now, we had a system forming, it was ELSA, that took a very similar path. I used the track of ADA to predict where ELSA would likely go, and it took a path very close to that. Once a system forms in hurricane season, like ELSA, it increases the probability, and I've done a 21-year analysis of hurricane seasons, it increases the probability of a stronger named system to form in another LRC cycle, which would be right now or and or in early October. So 
this part of the pattern is going to cycle through one more time before the whole new weather pattern sets up and there could be a major hurricane at that point heading towards florida so something to monitor for early october but right now fred is over land it's having a hard time going when it gets close to the keys and just west of florida into the gulf of mexico and you know it's hard for the west coast of florida to get hit but this year's target is the west coast of Florida predicted in February, if not way back last November, and it's happening. And that's the part that Eric would agree, we get blown away by it, even though I predict it and expect it, and it's happening. I, and I'll, no, I'll, and, say, and, that, okay. I'll say this, I'm, I'm blown away because Eric, I saw your graphic months ago where you highlighted yeah. the west coast of Florida and you were saying late June, early July, which was Elsa. And then you said mid August, which relates to the hypothesis. And what were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, and then again, you know, using that history also assists in talking about local impact. So for example, you know, while we may be not, while we may not be talking about a major hurricane in our area, I did an hour long broadcast this morning and my entire question list was what's going to happen in my county? What's going to happen in my county? And it helps me to say, Right now, it looks like a very similar influence of what the last cycle yielded, which was Elsa. So think about Elsa. It was a breezy day. It was a cloudy day. We had some tropical downpours. But it also lets me say the next cycle, that late, late September, early October, when the water temperatures are at their peak, when theoretically the Madden Julian oscillation should, you know, all these other pieces of the puzzle come together, that may be the one that's the big one that we really are going to have to get into more hurricane concern. So it also helps to tell kind of this weather story of comparing to the past, but also letting you know, hey, if you're if you're thinking about vacations, if you're thinking about this or that, come early October, just put a little asterisk in the back of your mind. And like Jeremy told me, circle on the calendar that early October time frame as we're going to be doing this all over again, the same but subtle. OK, different. OK, this is great. Eric knows when to schedule vacations. That's that's a. <laughs> That's a wonderful <laughs> secondary benefit here of exactly. the LRC. But Gary, I want to ask you, so you said uh, the, the cycle this year is 46.3 days or something like that for the for the repetition. What determines the cycle and are there cycles within the cycle each year, if that makes yeah, there's, sense? There's one that are called harmonics of the cycle. So um, like a lot of cycling things, if you have a 60 day cycle, then you'll have a 30 day harmonic, a 15 day harmonic, a seven and a half day harmonic, all the way down to a one day harmonic. There are these other subsets of those cycles, but you have one predominant cycle. So in October, November, let's say there's a major storm that hits the Chicago area. It's a huge storm where there's a severe weather outbreak, there's a snowstorm. Um, you look for that pattern to return and 46 47 days later this year the pattern returns and it's it's hard to see because it looks like chaos but it's not it's very very organized so you can also if it's 60 days or like 46 days cut it in half 23 days you'll see some hints or reflections of the bigger pattern as well and so okay. and you have you might have little mini cycles within that cycle that repeat over seven days but overall it's one big pattern that's cycling now, listeners, I think, okay, our, our listeners are predominantly northern Gulf Coast, southeast Louisiana, south Mississippi. We're talking October last year, and we know what happened in October in our area. We had Delta into southwest Louisiana, and we had um, Zeta right into the New Orleans metropolitan area. Are those part of this cycle, and when do we need to watch? Delta's October 4th to October 10th. Zeta was October 28th or so as I think it came into mm -hmm. Louisiana right near New Orleans, I think. Yeah. So it was a category three storm at that point. So that would be due around, um, I don't know, did you do your calculation? I think that Delta- Eric has it. Eric's gotta have it. <laughs> got it. Gonna be yeah. around so you've got Delta. August 24th to September 2nd, right? Yeah, yeah, right at the end. And then, and then again, you've got Zeta about mid-September. Right. I got okay. 13th, 13th to the 23rd of September is when that part of the pattern will cycle through. And that's right near the peak of hurricane season. So my concern, not that it will be a Katrina, 
we need to see some evidence. This season, so far, there has not been a strong hurricane yet. It's early. It's early still. Mm -hmm. But in the next two or three weeks, let's see if we start having a strong hurricane somewhere in the Atlantic or the Caribbean. It will have a reflection in past cycles. But if this season might be one that doesn't have stronger systems, there's usually a hint of them early when it's going to be a major season. It still is early, August the 12th or so. So in the next two weeks, it's something to monitor. But Zeta, September 13th to 23rd for New Orleans, you guys can start preparing now. And this, <laughs> this includes uh, the hotel industry, transportation, shipping. This includes every business that's impacted by weather. Now, you hold on. This, don't you think? Yeah. Now, well, Gary does. Data already do something this season, well, Gary. Well, I was going to ask him about Claudette, yeah. but just, just hold on a minute for everybody listening. So, <laughs> Gary, you know that Zach and I are going to have our listeners and our viewers on top of all this. They're going to know well ahead of time if there's going to be a threat. And, you know, we're prepared for hurricanes down here. It's a year-round type thing. So, I mean, we've got that part under control. But um, let's let's... <laughs> I just didn't. I just didn't want to like overly, I guess, panic people listening that this is Don't definitely going to happen. Don't and, say Katrina down here. <laughs> the, well, the chance of a Katrina is probably once in a hundred year storm, so probably that's not going to happen. Once in five hundred year storm, but there could still be a strong hurricane. So what? Um, I guess Eric was getting ready to ask this, and and did we already see a reflection of Zeta this season with Claudette? I look back at that, and, and Claudette was a very weak tropical storm that moved over us at the beginning of the season that had a track pretty much the same as Zeta. Eric? Yes. <laughs> if you look at, so if you look at the, the advisories for Zeta versus the advisories for Claudette, and you put them on top of each other, they were almost identical. And yeah, I mean, I've got a graphic in my computer the, the lines for the two systems were so identical, it's almost eerie. And so, yeah, absolutely. Well, so David, it was right when it was supposed to be as well. Eric, let's go back to Katrina. Katrina, that year's cycle was a long cycle, at least on my calculations. It was 74 to 79 days or so. And that year's the longest cycle I've ever had with the LRC. But Katrina happened, what was the date of Katrina? Do you remember the date? 29th, 2005. Okay. August. Um, so August. August 29th. You go back 75, 79 days before that, you had Tropical Storm Arlene in almost the identical spot as Katrina. Wow. So you have Arlene before Katrina. You have Cindy fifth, one cycle before major disaster Harvey. All right. And this year you've got Claudette likely an indicator of whatever Zeta Claudette is going to become between September 13th and 23rd. The probability of a system coming into Louisiana near New Orleans between September 13th and 23rd is an 84% chance based on the analytics using the LRC. And of course it is climatologically also the peak of the hurricane season but you're honing in on our area specifically Let, let's talk about this let's kind of broaden out again um with all of this gary um you know we've known for decades and decades about teleconnections uh in the atmosphere and, and how large-scale circulations connect with each other we know about things like pattern repetition we can see uh for instance uh just this summer uh, patterns setting up where We've had ridges over us, and then we continue to see this East Coast trough that's been developing. That's been going over and over. We know about things like the Arctic Oscillation and, and the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO, the PNA, all of those kind of things. What does that have to do with the LRC? I mean, are those, those are, are long-term um, uh, uh, you know, circulations that don't change you know, over short amounts of time. Most of those, you know, like the PDO and the NAO, they may stay in a certain state for years or even just for an entire year. How do those play together with uh, your uh, hypothesis? Well, well, the LRC is, is a pattern that sets up 
each year. And so there's a unique pattern, pattern that's never happened before that sets up. El Nino, La Nina, Enzo, uh, other oscillations that you talk about, the MJO, PNA, PDO, AO, NAO out there. Um, the, those oscillations likely have an influence on the LRC. La Nina and El Nino, I'm certain, have a significant influence but the LRC, the river of air above us right now flowing, that is a, a, a river of air. It's this big cycling pattern over the whole northern hemisphere. And there's one over the southern hemisphere too. Uh, that has influences, but it sets up in October. El Nino could be in one phase. La Nina could be in one phase. It could be a, a weak or moderate La Nina forming again this winter. And that could go to neutral or even to an El Nino or, or completely change phases, and yet the LRC doesn't change. But the influences on it might have other impacts. The pattern up there is still cycling regularly to what happened in October. Right now, we are in the same pattern that set up last October, and these other influences are influencing it, but that's what they are, influences on something that's bigger. They may all be tied together into one big thing, but this river of air that our peers think is just chaos is far from chaos. Is there's complete order to it? Now, would you so would you say say you set up that pattern? Okay, we see the pattern, the LRC last year. Oh, say we went to an El Nino right now, where usually that means less hurricane activity. Would that dampen that pattern going forward where, okay, right now it, the, the expectation is we could have a storm return from Delta in about two weeks. Maybe it's just a little weak tropical storm or something like that. Those other influences, would that influence that pattern totally? Yeah, you know, Zach, you just hit it right on the nose, really. There will still be a reflection of these systems, but if El Nino incre is developing and there's increased shear over the tropics, so the chance of a, a of named storms become less likely, then maybe there's a reflection of it, and it's just a complex of thunderstorms. Uh, there have been years where I was predicting a system to come right across the Gulf of Mexico, um, and I had a company that we were working for at that point with Weather 2020, my company, and um, that we. we if we would have hit that forecast, they said, yeah, we would have continued with you. But that year, a system crosses the Gulf of Mexico, a spinning area of little <laughs> showers, and it didn't manifest into anything. I'm like, form into something, because we predicted it. But there it was. The system was there. But that year, the conditions were not favorable for it to develop. Well, and look at early, like late, late July, early August. That was the last Zeta part of the pattern. And there was a ton of Saharan dust in place and the atmosphere wasn't doing anything in the tropics. But yet you guys got a big rain event in Louisiana and it went right up the East Coast. And if you followed its trajectory, it was right there with what Zeta did. It fit the pattern, even though it wasn't tropical in nature. So let me. So does the LRC, and we can talk about tornado outbreaks and blizzards and all that as well. Does this mainly work with big, impactful events, predicting things like that? Because last year we had thirty storms, and I don't think you can find uh, a relationship for each one of those storms that it related to the cycle. Is this is this more? Uh, a tool for forecasting major events like a Zeta, like the big hurricane you're saying is going to happen in mid-September, or some of the huge tornado outbreaks you guys have up there in Kansas City? First of all, David, I do believe there is an earlier indication for every one of those 30 systems. Okay, Within the cycling pattern, there is something in previous cycles that would have a least sm a small indicator, uh, a relationship to that. Um, overall, when the when we get to October, and November, the pattern sets up. Same thing with winter storms. If there's a winter storm and you know the cycle length, you can predict when there's going to be another winter storm. This year, Oklahoma City, perfect example. They had a major ice storm at the end of October at the exact same time Zeta is coming into Louisiana. So you have Zeta coming into Louisiana, part of the pattern, and you have Oklahoma getting blasted by an extremely rare October major, major ice storm, which probably will never happen again in October in Oklahoma, mm. in Oklahoma City. 
what happened 46 days later as we got into December? Oklahoma City has a snowstorm and there's a reflection of Zeta. Either Zeta or Delta had a major snowstorm in the deep south in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, I think got some snow this year from the Zeta or the Delta part of the pan. I forget, Eric, which one it was. And you tweeted that. And the best part was you said, what would you believe? Basically, you know, it was like, would you believe me if this was because of this? And, you know, to right. anybody that's following this, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. To anybody that's not, it's so like, I mean, what do you, what? But now, I need to go back and look at my tweet. I need to go back and look at my tweet to see what I wrote because that is returning now. A snowstorm can be related to a hurricane. Isn't that amazing? So, but let's talk about, so the, the cycle, the new cycling it, patterns that begins in October, right? That's what we established. Right. So that means the predictability for October, November events aren't usually as good. Would that be right? right? You, that is a very good assessment. Uh, using the LRC, if you're a really good forecaster, maybe in October and November, you do pretty good. But by the time you get to December, <laughs> if, if you do... <laughs> if you do December forward, especially January forward, then you get to the sweet spot of the LRC and you can make much better predictions. What's so funny, Zach? <laughs> October, November, we're in trouble. <laughs> I know. I've got a I've got a computer model. We have a great computer model. For example, our model, you know, I don't know Japan's weather patterns. I haven't studied Japan's weather patterns, but you know, I work at KSHB, the NBC affiliate here in Kansas City. And we have the Olympics on. So I made a prediction for the Japan Olympics months before our computer model did. Our model showed Japan getting hit by significant increase in precipitation in the first five days of the Olympics. And I didn't realize, and I still have to go study, but that tropical storm that headed into Japan a couple weeks ago was predicted by our model. Now on the model, it just looks like an increased area of precipitation. Same thing with Claudette. We have a model that shows Louisiana, New Orleans, getting an increased amount of precipitation. There's an art and science to what we do. The science, the model shows you this precipitation. The art, we know that it's probably a tropical storm that's coming in. That's kind of my next question because we had um, Ada and we also had significant Iota. Uh, was Iota not part of this? Is it only specifically in a certain part of the globe? And, uh, you know, what can we look at the West Coast and figure out this is going to happen for them depending on what their weather is in October and November? Let me look and see. I, I have my, my January prediction. Let me see if I wrote down Iota in here. Because um, Iota was the last storm, right? Yeah, I, that comes yeah. I don't have that in mind. Like, how I do you know, know when the pattern? How do you know when the pattern cuts off? When that LRC stops and then it starts repeating? The well, when was IOTA? Do you know when IOTA was exactly? It was well. It was sometime in November. Second week in November, I think. Yeah, that that. Let me hold, hold just a second. I'm gonna call it up. <laughs> All right. Well, while you're doing that, let me ask you ask these questions, Gary. So you talk about the northern hemisphere. Has anybody test this in the southern hemisphere, or do you have any clue as to? I know I haven't studied the southern hemisphere, but I do know that the southern hemisphere um, has a cycle too. I think it's related to the northern hemisphere. I just haven't studied it enough yet. Yeah, I, I Oda, by the way, was November eighteenth. And it tracked, okay, it was way down in the Caribbean. So it tracked across the South Caribbean since it was almost, you know, it's deep into fall and went right into Mexico, produced tremendous flooding and is a major hurricane in Mexico. But since it tracked way down there, there may be another one on schedule, but likely way down there, not targeting the United States, if that makes sense. That makes sense. What about with um, what about temperature trends? Does it work with temperatures or does it just work with, um, you know, storms? It absolutely works with temperature trends as well. For example, if there's an Arctic outbreak in November that is caused by a 
mid-latitude synoptic setup, um, a big ridge in Western Canada that creates the conditions for the Arctic air, you can predict with reliability, just like the tropics, that there will be another Arctic outbreak right on schedule. And so um, we have very good success with predicting the Arctic outbreaks, severe weather outbreaks. Um, I was on with uh, James Spann with his weather brains a couple years ago when uh, we knew that around Easter, we were on in February, and I said 45 days from now, we're on Easter weekend, you're, you're going to have a severe weather outbreak. And he goes, okay, I'm gonna write that down. And <laughs> then, because uh, James is a, has been a skeptic of long range forecasting, but he, what happened on Easter Sunday, two years ago, significant outbreak, including his area in Alabama. So um, there's predictability, significant predictability for severe weather, Arctic outbreaks, heat waves, flooding events, droughts, tropical storms, hurricanes. You, you know, and I think it's interesting you bring that up. And uh, James Spann, of course, uh, one of the most respected broadcast meteorologists out there in the country, has a, quite a wide following nationally. Uh, you know, and you talk about him being skeptical about long-range forecasting. I don't know if he's skeptical in general or just skeptical of the LRC. Um, but a lot of people have pushed back against you, Gary, over the years. I've seen you having to fight for this. And, and one thing that any scientist wants is they want to be published their research and uh, they want it to be in a peer-reviewed journal. That didn't happen for a long time. Um, you know, and some of that I think is uh, what we have to worry about is, is people getting caught in one mindset and one way of thinking. I mean, part of science is constantly questioning what's known because we know there's unknowns out there that have yet to been discovered. What what was your experience like? And you did eventually get published. Uh, well, fortunately, we got a peer review paper published and it's uh, called the Cycling Patterns of the Northern Hemisphere. You can Google it and, and find it if you want to look, look for it. Um, and I have an article that was published in Meteorological Technology International Magazine a couple of years ago. So it's great to have a couple, a couple of items published because uh, this is something that is, exists for everyone to see. It's in the 1940s from Jerome Nemias when he began to discover it to when I found it independently in the 1980s to advancing it to now. Yes, there's skeptics out there. For example, just yesterday, AccuWeather has an article out about, there's a whole article about uh, could there be atmospheric memory, okay? Could there be a memory of the atmosphere? And they showed Elsa's track and they're showing Fred's track. Is that just a coincidence? And the head forecaster at AccuWeather says, is this possible? And he says, a firm no, okay? What, what, how does he know that? No, he, he, it's actually a firm yes, the exact opposite of what he says. But on faith, he's not going to believe it. On faith, our peers aren't going to believe it. We need more work, and I'm working on it, and more peer-reviewed papers, and we'll try to do that, but as a chief meteorologist on a TV station, how much time do you have to write a peer-reviewed paper? It's amazing I got one written. <laughs> You know? I'm not criticizing your work ethic, Gary. I have no <laughs> doubt on that. Okay, what whatsoever. Uh, definitely not. Okay, so let, let's sum things up here. Eric, uh, help me with my memory. So what are we looking out for next? We've got Fred, and uh, here on the Gulf Coast, uh, we've got potentially two additional threats. Is that right? Yeah, so you've got Grace, which is Invest 95 right now, and that would fit around the gamma part of the pattern of course gamma kind of weakened as it lifted to the north and then after that you've got the delta part of the pattern so um you know just kind of rounding out the next few weeks going into september I, based on all of the information that uh that follows the lrc the ideas are these these waves are going to want to focus in on the gulf of mexico and each one kind of trending a little further off to the west gary tell me if i'm wrong yeah, the, the one that you're talking about now that has a, there's one out there, a 60% chance of cyclone formation. It's actually a system that has, Zach, to answer your question earlier, there's an indication, there's an indication of this next system 
that we have been spotting. It's one of our top seven forecasts. This next one would be right on schedule for about seven to 10 days from now. So we'll see. Um, but uh, that one would target the Florida, that would target the east coast of Florida uh, more directly. So this next one has a better chance of targeting east Florida. I can show, Eric, I'll send you my stuff, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Please, that is yeah. definitely one of our top predictions. And I do well, want to, I want to follow up with a question because we were talking about winter storms, temperature. Eric, have you done it? You've done it with the tropics. I know that. Have you done it during the winter with Florida? Now, I know y'all temperatures don't change that much, uh, but have you seen yeah. Arctic outbreaks uh, happen uh, when they're supposed to so, all the way down to Florida? The one thing that Jeremy had me do this year was journal. As soon as we hit October, journal every day, high temperature, low temperature, rainfall, departure from average on everything and take notes. And once we kind of locked into, oh, the pattern's recycling, so this is this day, this is this day, I started I started seeing trends. And just just for fun, I started putting out kind of broad monthly forecast, um, kind of saying, hey, this is where we have an opportunity to get some wetter weather. This is where we could be talking about some cooler weather. And uh, one of my followers on my morning Facebook, Twitter, broadcast blog whatever you want to call it uh into he's an engineer retired and he criticized critiqued whatever you want to call it he gave me a 75 percent accuracy rate based strictly on the lrc following temperature trends rain trends so it wasn't perfect but frankly neither is the seven day forecast that any of us use or a 10 day for you know i mean at the end of the day there's just inherently some things that change, but a 75% accuracy rate that I said late week, a month from now, plan on some storms. And asterisk, if it yielded severe weather, then the next time there may be a threat for severe weather. And there are, hey, you know, we had tornadoes in Tampa and then this cycle around, hey, we had a severe thunderstorm warning in our area. And the next cycle around, hey, there was hail in Tampa, you know, so you're following these little trends. There is that organization to the chaos. All we right, need to guys. start circling the calendar, David. We need to start circling the calendar. Zach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do that on the calendar uh, back at the office. Guys, this has been a great conversation. Uh, it's fascinating. Gary, of course, I've been uh, reading about this and hearing about this from you for years. And uh, I admire your determination. And uh, you know what? And your contribution. I think it's, uh, it's an interesting hypothesis and one that needs to continue to be tested. Now, we like to finish on the podcast with a question. You knew you were a weather geek when? Let's start with Eric. So I'm working on getting tropical data into my weather computer. So I realized recently that I was just a geek when I found Microsoft Excel <laughs> is the greatest tool on the face of the planet. <laughs> when did you first uh, get interested in weather? Hurricane Andrew, when it struck South Florida and the world seemed to change here. They building codes and sure. I mean, the world changed and it's just never stopped me from it. Now, Gary, yours is probably a little bit before Andrew, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was back in 1967, probably uh, 19. When I was five, six years old, I became interested in weather. Don't even remember exactly how, uh, when I was 10, nine, 10 years old, I created, because remember, I grew up in Southern California in Los Angeles where the weather was really boring, but I didn't know it was boring. I thought it was the most exciting weather in the world. I didn't know you could get thunderstorms and tropical storms and hurricanes. I was like, wow, look, there's a cloud, All right? So, uh, so it was exciting, but back then I created my own little world in a circle and I made eight little towns and I would like draw in the weather maps and then I'd practice. And my mom probably thought, what the heck is he doing? And I'd be like, all right, area one has an increasing chance of showers this week, and there's a winter storm heading towards area two, and I'd be in my room creating this game. I like, I still have them somewhere in my basement, but uh, it is uh, that's when I became a, a weather geek. Wow. Been creating and thinking ever since then. Uh, great minds here today. Appreciate the conversation, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. 
So we have the Lezak Recurring Cycle, the LRC. Wow, that is an interesting discussion. I've heard a lot about this from Gary over the years and read about it. And there are going to be a lot of skeptics out there. It's an hypothesis. That's all it is at this point in time. Uh, there, there is some empirical evidence for it. But again, I think it probably has a really long way to go. I think one thing that we want to emphasize, uh, Gary, you know, started getting a little bit hyped up there and use the Katrina word uh, when talking about the pattern that we're in this summer. Uh, but again, let's let's kind of review specifically. Again, he said that this year's cycle, which started last October, uh, is a 46.3 day cycle and that we had Claudette early in the season, right? We had Claudette and then what happened after that? Okay, so Zeta is the reoccurring cycle. We hit Claudette in the middle of June and so it reoccurred at the end of July and early August. And this goes back to, this doesn't mean a hurricane's gonna hit you every single time you reoccur that, that pattern. What did we see at the end of July, early August? We saw a cold front make it all the way down to the Gulf Coast and there was an aerial pressure that developed along the Louisiana coast and moved off to the north and east, almost like Zeta. So that's what was the reoccurring aspect of the pattern then. And now he said, we're going to hit it again in the middle of September. So that's when we should be watching out for another type of low pressure. Or could it possibly be some type of tropical system? Uh, we'll see. Because <laughs> that'll be 46 days later. And one reason when we asked him, he said, well, why didn't we get a tropical storm or a hurricane 46 days after Claudette this year? And of course, he said, well, there was a lot of dry air. If you remember uh, that part of the end of June, beginning of July, after a really wet June, we finished with a much drier atmosphere and it wasn't as conducive uh, for tropical cyclone formation. So obviously this is nowhere near perfect. Uh, neither is any kind of weather forecasting because you can have very short term pattern changes or uh, conditions in the atmosphere that can make things more favorable or less favorable. And, and I don't know if we have the ability on a long time scale like he's doing uh, to make these kind of predictions. Exactly. And it's science. I mean, it's it, it's it's a hypothesis. Does it work out every time? And you always say this, it's the words of Brian Norcross. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Say it again. Uh, precision is the enemy of accuracy. So exactly. So, you know, if you're precisely trying to say a hurricane's going to come, you're probably going to get it wrong. But an area of low pressure in the Gulf, you know, that's that's a tropical wave and or that's a cold front approaching the Gulf. So, you know, that whole precision thing, that's the part that everybody's going to think it's wrong. But in the end, you know, I think there is some kind of reoccurring pattern, but there's a lot of reoccurring patterns in the atmosphere. We know about the MJO. We know about PNA. The Arctic Oscillation, there's there's teleconnections. Everything's all connected together at once. This morning, I did that on my uh, Tracking the Science segment of how everything on this earth is connected one way or another. Well, I think that's a good note to end on there. And a reminder, everybody, stick with us here on Fox 8 and Fox8Live.com for the latest on Fred as we go throughout the next few days. And of course, for the rest of the season on whatever develops in the tropics, regardless of the uh, recurring cycle or not. For Zach Fredella, I'm David Bernard. Stay safe out there and we'll see you next time.